Uh, we have been in a series of conversations around doubt, journey through doubt. This is kind of the end and the beginning of the next series. We're going to be talking about why community, friendships, uh, being at the church is so important and vital to our lives. Uh, so I'm going to kind of wrap all of it up, which is going to be a, a, great, a great time together. But uh, the thing we're going to be talking about today is the reality that the, the, the struggle is real. You know what I mean? The struggle's just real. Uh, I've told you before, uh, I've been trying to work out more, um, but I'm like, I don't have any ability to slow down. So we were doing deadlifts, like this was months ago. Uh, it was a stupid exercise. If you don't know what a deadlift is, just, you're, just be happy that you don't know. Um, but like I had probably way too much weight on the bar. I don't, it wasn't that much, but it was too much. And I don't, form doesn't matter, tempo doesn't matter, none of that matters. Just like, you don't have to stretch or anything, just go in and start working out. I've told CJ that I don't stretch. And he's like, you don't stretch? I'm like, I don't need to stretch. Uh, muscles don't stretch. Um, yeah, so I pulled my back, obviously. It was a natural next step. And uh, it was so bad, like it was so bad. Uh, it was got to the point where, like, I think they call it a sciatic nerve, which I thought that was like a 50s to 60s thing. Your sciatic nerve starts to mess you up. So I thought I can't, can't possibly have nerve problems as a 36-year-old person. Um, so, but my whole leg went numb. Uh, I literally couldn't walk. I could barely get out of bed. And it's not like a man cold. It, like, really hurt. Like, it was, like, it was extremely painful. And I just wanted a little grace at home. And, uh... So I'm just going to talk about that for a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it hurt so bad. And I went to the doctor. I went to my friend who I work out with. He's a doctor. So he was like putting me through like this, like, I don't know, zap thing it was nuts. And uh, that helped a bit. And then I got steroids from the doctor, which was a gift from God. Oh, my Lord. That stuff was crazy. Now I know why that stuff's illegal in sports. It's like you take that. It's like I could do anything. Literally any day, I'll run a marathon right now without any work whatsoever. And then she's like, my doctor's like, if you need another dose, we can give you another one. And so I was like, bet. And I called like five times. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't answer the call. I think they think it's like, well, I'm not, I, just, I just felt good to have that stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, all that to say, uh, I had the wrong form. I had the wrong timing. I was a mess for like weeks. For weeks, it was like horrible, even now. It's like if I golf too much, it's like my back is done, and it's just a terrible way to live. Uh, and it's a dysfunctional mess. Uh, I struggled dysfunctionally, because working out is actually really healthy. Like, you should work out, but you should work out right. You know what I mean? Like, you should struggle properly, and it actually benefits your life. As I got thinking, like, you know, you and I, we struggle. You know what I mean? Like, you, you will go through things in life and it's going to be a struggle. Like, you'll hit seasons of life that literally just don't make sense. Like, there's a line in that firm foundation song that we sang that's like, that like God will bring joy in chaos, a peace that makes no sense. And if you think about your life, if you're not struggling right, you'd be like, joy in chaos? Now, this just feels like 100% all the way chaotic. Like, a peace that makes no sense? If I just had a peace that, like, made any figment of sense... I would be happy. But if you look at your life, like, it matters how you choose to struggle. Because if there's any guarantee about life, like, if you thought you were going to come to church today and, like, the guy's going to get up or the girl's going to get up and just be like, man, if you follow Jesus, no more pain. Like, you are at the wrong place. Okay, I just want you to know that, like, life has a tendency to not add up. Like, there's something about life where when push comes to shove, sometimes it feels like a little more push than shove. You know what I mean? It's like, it feels like at times, like life feels like it's winning right now and I'm going to be buried with the struggle. Like, you and I, we will struggle. And how you struggle matters. Because there is actually a way to honor God through our struggle. Because here's what you'll find, and I know you probably know this, but like when life gets difficult, it will directly impact how you treat other people. Like when life gets hard, when life starts to not make sense, if you're not struggling right, everyone will feel the ripple effects of your pain. Like if you're not struggling properly and life starts to not add up, everyone around you will start to feel the pain of the struggle that you are carrying. And you can see this because what our tendency is what we end up doing is making our lives as small as possible 
when things don't start to make sense. Because if I can't control everything that's happening out there, I have to do something to make my life feel somewhat comfortable. And so if you're going through stuff, you'll start to realize that everybody you surround yourself with, they start to look like you, they start to talk like you, they start to think like you, because at least you've got your in-group, you've got your posse, you've got your crew. And if I can't control everybody out there, at least I'm going to make sure that everybody I surround myself with looks like me. Now that might sound like an interesting and maybe slightly healthy way to live, but it's not just so you know, because there's actually a beauty in diversity. There's actually something to be said for surrounding yourself with people who don't look like you, talk like you, smell like you, vote like you. Shocking. It's a way that you can actually live your life. And what's wild is if we sat here and we asked each other, like, do you wish that you lived a more diverse life? Everyone would probably say, yeah, of course. I would love to like live a more diverse life. If we were to ask, like, do you? If we were to ask churches, like, do you want to have a more diverse church? Every pastor on the planet, I actually think they have a number. It's like ninety percent of pastors say they want a more diverse church. But currently, right now, eighty-five percent of churches in America are one ethnicity. That is what studies show is that as the world gets more polarized, which it currently is, it is more polarized now than it's been in decades. In fact, even politically speaking, one side of the aisle and the other side of the aisle, those two sides have never looked more different from each other. We're actually in shocking polarized areas right now. And if anywhere should have the answer of what life can look like, it should be the church. If there's any place where someone can go and see that there's still hope to be found, that place should be the church. If there's anywhere people can go and be like, man, how are other people dealing with the struggle that I'm feeling right now? They should be able to find that answer in the church. Now, the beauty of the Father's house is when you look around, and if you've never been here before, it might shock you a little bit, but we happen to be an extremely diverse church which is incredible. We are diverse politically, culturally, ethnically. You will come in here and you will find every walk of life imaginable because our goal and our dream is to be a place where no matter what you look like, vote like, smell like, talk like, you can find hope and healing in this place. And what's so amazing about it, if we're not careful, one, we'll take it for granted, but two, we won't realize that this is actually heaven-touching earth. Like, a a community like this is genuinely what heaven will look like. You need to understand this, that this is not normal. This is heaven touching earth. We're in the midst of one of the most polarizing times in our culture. We can be surrounded by people who just think differently than you. It is an amazing thing that we shouldn't take for granted. It is actually the heartbeat of God. And he will help us to answer the question is, how do I struggle right? Because we serve a God who actually welcomes the struggle. We serve a God who is not, he is well acquainted with the fact that we as humans consistently cannot figure life out perfectly. He is well acquainted with our pain and he welcomes the struggle. So today, we are going to go through scripture And we are going to see how one particular person dealt with struggle, how they had to navigate a broken world. They had to deal with personal issues. They had to deal with doubts. They had to deal with losses. They had to learn that they were struggling dysfunctionally, and God had to be faithful. So the question you have to ask yourself before we get started is, are you struggling dysfunctionally? Because a healthy church is a church that knows how to struggle right. So today we're going to look at the story. The guy's name is Jacob. Again, he had a life full of dysfunctional struggle. His life is rife with division, lying, deception. Like he was constantly just trying to get ahead. Like Jacob was a guy from from birth. Like scripture talks about from birth. This guy had in his head that he was going to be the man. He was going to win every single time. So here's some background before we get into the story too far. Some background, his grandfather, even if you've never been to church, you'll know the name Abraham. Abraham's like the OG, like Abraham is the guy, okay? Like he, like that's, this is Jacob's grandfather. That's a lot of pressure. If if your grandfather is Abraham, 
It's like he's like the patriarch of the faith. You know what I mean? And like we even sing songs about him. If you grew up in the church, it's like Father Abraham. He had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. And then you like turn around in circles. And like I, I could never understand the right arm, left arm thing. It was like a thing. Uh, never daughters. Daughters never got a lyric, I don't think. But he had many sons, at least. And so... It's another one of those things we've worked on. Um, but anyway, uh, Abraham was his grandfather, a lot of pressure. He gets the, ch- the church songs. Um, and then Abraham, now talk about, this is nuts, okay? His story's wild. Abraham has a moment with God where God says, look up at the stars and count them if you can. So shall your descendants be. It's like one of the most beautiful pictures. The problem is Abraham is an old man, and he can't, his wife, literally Sarah, cannot have kids. And so he comes back to Sarah, and he's like, we're going to have children. And she just laughs at him because she's like, no, I'm not. Look at me. I'm old. Like, it's over. Like, relax. Anyway, Abraham's 100 years old and has his first kid, Isaac. Isaac happens to be Jacob's dad. Now, Isaac's story is wild because God promises Abraham uh, a son, and then God tests Abraham's faith. This is why we're very grateful to live in New Testament church. To test Abraham's faith, he's like, I want you to take Isaac up to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice to me. This is wild. If somebody comes to you and says, God is telling me to offer my kids as a, as a sacrifice, get them counseling, don't support them, okay? <laughs> Say, the kids, your kids are not that bad. But this is a different time, different culture, different people. This is like the beginning of it all. God's, anyway, we could talk a whole lot about the Abraham-Isaac thing. God stops it. He's like, I get it. You do trust me. Anyway, now Isaac's probably got a complex for several years. But now Isaac, he marries Rebecca, and they have two sons, Jacob and Esau. And this is where the story gets crazy because their upbringing, Jacob and Esau, there's a host of issues. And through the life of Jacob, we are going to learn how to struggle right through a lot of mistakes that Jacob made, but together we're going to learn how to struggle right. So if you want to struggle wrong, here's how you do it. Struggle with people. If you want to struggle wrong, struggle with people. Look around at the people around you and be like, you are the issue that is going to end me. Like, that's how you struggle wrong. Now, again, I'm a decently competitive person, so even if I'm bad at something, I don't want to lose. Uh, generally, if I'm really bad, I'll just stop playing the thing because I just, like, I can't, I don't want to be bad at stuff. It's a dysfunction. And so, but if I do play, so, like, I'll say, like, we have basketball courts out back. CJ is easily five to ten times better at basketball than me. That's not even, like, an exaggeration. Maybe more. He could be 20 times better than me. Um, but I have it in my head, and if you don't know CJ, he's our family pastor. I have it in my head that if I'm going to play basketball with CJ, I'm going to win. I'm not going to win. It's an impossibility. It's, it will not happen. Like, I, God would literally have to come down and be like, I will help you do this. Uh, I'm not going to beat him. But I have it in my head. Like, I'm going to kill him at this game. It's terrible. It's, it sets me up for disappointment. But that's how I am just wired. So uh, my daughter comes home. Uh, like a couple weeks ago. Now, she's seven, seven years old, okay? So she's young. Uh, She comes home, and, like, she says to us that at school, another girl who uh, we're working on it, don't like, but we're working on it, we love people, uh, she hit my daughter in the face. Now, if you know Chloe, don't punch Chloe. It's nuts. And so I'm furious. Like, I'm just like, now, Esther is a little bit more, like, you know, well-rounded than me. So she drops him off at school. She's like, have a good day. Don't forget to pray. And, like, they, they know these things. They, like, memorize these things. And, like, she comes home, and, like, I literally, it's as if, now, this, this poor other girl, it's like, I'm not even mad at this girl's parents. No, 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 no. It's her. It's, just, it's just another seven-year-old girl. I'm like, and so I stopped everything because, like, they're trying to have a conversation about feelings. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I was like, Chloe, I was like, you understand, and I didn't run this by Esther, I was like, you know that, like, when you get angry at me, and you get blackout angry, and, like, you'll, like, you'll just go nuts, you'll, like, hit me, and it hurts, she's like, yeah, 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 I was like, okay, so next time someone hits you, you do that, I was like, I was like, just go crazy, I was like, you do whatever you can to never let that happen again. That is dysfunctional parenting, okay? I'm willing to admit that that is probably not the best way to do it. But in my dysfunctional brain, I think that when someone wrongs me, my job is to get even. Like when someone gets something that I think I deserve, my job is to get even. And now what we are going to see through the story of Jacob is this man struggled with other people for the vast majority of his life. 
In fact, Scripture says in Genesis 25 that when Jacob and Esau, they're twins, Esau is born first. And on his way out of the womb, Jacob, Scripture says, is literally holding on to his heel. He's desperate to get ahead. This is the condition of humanity is that you and I, we want to win. So when we see someone else succeed, we need to get even. When we see someone else achieving something in life, we just have to knock them down a couple notches. We read things like turn the other cheek, and we think that Jesus had a typo. It's like, no, no, no. It's like we have to get even. And so Jacob, from the jump, He's grabbing at his brother's heels in order to get ahead, okay? It goes on. Now, in this culture, it's a different culture than us. They would have birthrights, and then the, the patriarch of the family would give a blessing to the, usually the oldest son got the birthright and the blessing. The birthright was the assets of the family, the land, uh, all the tangible things. They would take on the religious duties. They were considered the new patriarch. They were carrying on the name. The birthright was like set in stone. The blessing... The, the father would give like a, basically a prophetic declaration over the oldest son that would carry on the family's like divine legacy. Both of these things were extremely important in this culture. And so what Jacob does, because he's not the oldest, he tricks his brother into selling him the birthright because his brother was just hungry. So sells him the birthright. It, the whole thing is crazy. So he steals that from him. And then later, his father Isaac's on his deathbed and Jacob's like... His mom like helps him because she was dysfunctional too, and she's like, you need to like go in there and pretend that you're Esau, and you'll trick your dad. He can barely see, and he's going to give you the blessing, and Jacob does it. Now, at this point in the story, uh, Jacob has done everything he can to get ahead. He does this, and Esau, it literally says that he held a grudge, and he planned to kill Jacob next time he saw him. Like, it's over. I'm going to kill this man. So Jacob obviously flees. He goes to a place called uh, Haran. You can read it in Genesis 27. There he starts working for a man named Laban, and he has two daughters. Okay, and so now these Laban and and Jacob are constantly just deceiving each other. If you read it, they're just tricking each other. They're lying to each other. The whole thing is messed up. Jacob ends up working for him for like, I think it's like 15 years, almost 20 years. It's unbelievable. He ends up marrying both of the guy's daughters, okay, which again, Anybody who tells you that the Bible condones polygamy, anybody in Scripture who had multiple wives had a very dysfunctional life. Everything fell apart every single time, okay? That was not the original intent. But anyway, uh, Jacob's wives end up hating each other. It's like a bitter bitter rivalry between these two wives. Their kids end up hating each other. Uh, It's like it's such division. There's strife. There's stress. All of this stuff happens uh, all because Jacob has to get ahead. And now it's been 20 years of him being rife with issues, all because he had misplaced struggle and no trust. He's now sitting with a divided family, a lot of money, but a brother who seemingly wants to kill him. He's got, he's constantly finding himself alone. His life is a mess. You never win when your primary focus is to struggle with other people. You see, you see this in marriage. You realize that your wife or your spouse might not be the problem. Like you do understand that when there's an issue in your marriage, the other person might actually not be the problem. Now there could be problems, but when we're so in tune with struggling with other people and getting our gloves ready for an absolute war, anytime we're faced with conflict, I must destroy the other person. And so now marriages fall apart because the other person is a problem. You see this with friendships. Your friends start to succeed a little bit. And now your insides are just tearing you apart because you're like, when am I going to get mine? When's it going to be my break? When's it going to be my opportunity? Why do they constantly get open doors and I'm sitting here trying to navigate this stuff that I always have to deal with? And now we spend our times comparing ourselves to other people's successes, ignoring the fact that maybe they went through years of failure themselves before God opened up the right door at the right time for the right reason. None of that matters when the gloves are on. We see this in our own personal lives. We deal with so much insecurities, so much self-doubt, so much just like intake of stress and anxiety. We make ourselves believe that it's never going to get better. 
We make ourselves believe that I just have to fight myself in order to feel anything good inside. So we self-medicate, we turn to drugs, we turn to alcohol, and we do things that destroy the very future we were trying to protect in the first place. But the gloves are on, and we're struggling dysfunctionally. It's impossible to have good relationships when we choose to struggle with other people. It's impossible to extend arms of love. It's impossible to extend arms of grace. It's impossible to extend arms of mercy when it's you against the world. When the answer is I just got to pull myself up by my bootstraps and grind until my hands fall off. If it's you against the world, you will always end up lonely. This is the nature and the plight of humanity, is that there's something innate inside of us that just desperately wants peace. There's something innate in all of us that just desperately wants to hope for something. The issue is we put our gloves on and we're ready to fight anyone who gets in between us and our idea of what success looks like. I can promise you that this is the posture of a broken culture. This right here is the posture of a culture that desperately wants to win but doesn't want to actually experience hope and acceptance. Maybe there's a better way. So Jacob finds himself in this situation where his family's falling apart, his brother wants to kill him, he's done everything he can to get ahead by struggling with other people, and what we're going to find is Jacob finds himself alone. Just for a brief few moments, he finds himself alone. Because what ends up happening is he has to leave where he is, and now he's going to go back to his home uh, city, his home country, his home region, and he's going to see his brother Esau for the first time in two decades. Now, for the first time in two decades, Jacob is going to run into the guy who he feels like is going to end his life. Like, in, in Jacob's mind, it's over. When I go back there, this dude, we are going to fight, and he's going to kill me. I just know he's going to. So here's what we're going to do. And he sets up this whole plan Okay, and he's, he's like, we're going to just inundate this guy with kindness. We're going to give him gifts. Uh, Jacob, at this point, had so much money, and you, they, it was like cattle and like sheep and herds, and he's like, we're going to divide up some. We're going to give him extravagant gifts, and we're going to create a parade of gifts, and then we're going to honor him with our family members. We're going to bow down to him. By the time he finally gets to me, he will be such, his heart will be so softened, there's no way he's going to kill me. So this is his grand plan. He thinks he's got it in the bag. He's going to skirt this one, but he's terrified of what might happen. And so here's where we are going to learn how a healthy church learns to struggle right. Because what we're going to find is that you struggle right by struggling with God. So this is what it says in chapter 32. Now, here's the deal. This story has a moment that is like totally bizarre. Okay, what I'm going to read to you, you're like, if that ever happened to me, I think I would, like, admit myself. This is, like, nuts. Again, in this time, in this culture, God would do things far differently than he currently does today. So we're going to read about a part. You're going to be like, wait, what? Just know that God is interacting with Jacob in a very unique way for that time and that culture. But here's what it says. So Jacob, uh, that night, he got up and he took his two wives, two female servants, his 11 sons, he crossed the fort of the uh, Jabbok. After he had sent them across, and he sent over all of his possessions, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. In this story, we see Jacob has struggled literally and physically with a messenger from God. He struggled with God. Now, Jacob at this point is basically at the end of himself. He realizes that tomorrow at this time, he could be dead. He's at the complete end of his rope. 
And it was at the, when he's at the end of his rope, God sends a messenger, and they literally struggle the entire night. Now, what's crazy is that on the other side of the struggle was the answer that Jacob needed. He didn't know he needed it. He didn't know it was the answer he wanted. But God gave him the answer he'd been giving him his entire life. Hey, Jacob, you are the guy I am choosing. He told him that a few weeks ago when he was laying on a pillow or on a rock pillow in the middle of the wilderness, and God gives him a vision of heaven and earth ascending, or heaven and angels ascending and descending on the earth. Jacob wakes up and says, man, this is an awesome place. Surely this is the house of God. Like God has been showing up in Jacob's life uh, all the time, protecting him, actually basically calling out to him. Now in this moment, Jacob is meeting him face to face. They're having a struggle. And then God, on the other side of the struggle, he changes his name from Jacob to Israel, which literally means struggles with God. Now, if you know anything about uh, the Old Testament and church history, Israel becomes God's chosen people. Isn't this wild that the people that God chooses, the name literally means struggles with God? Like if you and I were writing this epic story, we might pick a name like Mighty Warriors, you know, like Great Nation. You know, like, I, I don't, like, think about it, like powerful people. You could think of a million different names that would describe the people that you're choosing better than God chooses the name for his people. He literally picks a name that is struggles with God. He could have done this any way he wanted. But when God chooses his people, he chooses them after a fierce fight with himself. And if you just follow the narrative of the people of Israel, it just fits. They were constantly faced with hardships. They were constantly faced with struggles. Some self-induced, others they had no control over. All throughout their history, it was struggle. And all throughout it, they saw and felt the faithfulness of of God. This is why I find faith in God to be so amazing. This is why I think being a follower of Jesus is wild. Because think about this, the, not even to throw shade, okay, at all, but if you look at like uh, Islam literally means submit to God, okay? Israel means struggle with God. Now, I'm human enough to know that I would rather a God that welcomes my struggle than a God who demands I submit. I would rather follow a God who's like, hey, I understand that you are going to go through some stuff. I understand that this isn't always going to be easy. But what I'm inviting you into is for the struggle of your life. And just so you are aware, I am well acquainted with your pain. Just so you are aware, I am actually inviting you in to struggle with me. Notice what this guy never does. He never rebukes Jacob for fighting him. Not once. He actually affirms it. I'm going to change your name. You fought me so well. I'm actually going to make it your very name. God is a God who actually welcomes the struggle. And I love that it says that he, uh, the guy realized that this dude is never going to give up. He is so desperate for an answer from me. So it says that the guy touched the socket of his hip, and Jacob walked with a limp thereafter. I can promise you, church, do not trust people who do not walk with a limp. Do not trust people who act like they've got their lives all together, but you know they're either hiding stuff or they've never been through anything. Don't trust people who don't walk with some scars of what they've been through. Because I'll tell you something. When you talk to some people who've been through stuff, they will never say, man, I just wish God would have just taken it all away. I wish I never went through any of that. That's never the first thing they say. They will tell you of the stories of the faithfulness of God in the midst of their struggle. You see, this is why it is so important that we understand this. Because when we say struggle with God, what I'm not saying is put the proverbial gloves on and be like, all right, God, we're going to duke this bad boy out. Let's go. No, but what I am saying is that when you cast your cares upon him, he cares. What I am saying is that when you struggle with God, you can read Psalm 23 where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he doesn't say, I'll kill everyone on the way. No, he says, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And so God is accustomed 
to your pain. He is accustomed to the fact that you are going to go through struggles, and he welcomes you walking up to him with your gloves on. And he says, hey, let me just slide those things off for a moment. And if you would just allow me to work your heart out a little bit, I promise you, you're going to get an answer. It might not be the answer you're looking for. You might walk with a limp for the rest of your life. It might not look like you always dreamed of it looking. It might not be the figment of your imagination where you're going to have the white picket fence and two kids and a dog and it's going to be beautiful and you're going to have everything, but I promise you that there's going to be a story to your limp. I can promise you that after this moment, Jacob was never the same. He had a constant daily reminder of the goodness of God, and Jacob is not alone. God uses almost exclusively through Scripture horrible people. Like exclusively, he has a way of just, he called David a man after God's own heart. We could do a whole college semester on how broken David was as a human being. God used Abraham. Abraham was a broken man. God used Noah. Noah built the ark and then ended it in a drunken stupor. He was a broken man. God used Mary, the sister of Lazarus. She was a broken woman before she met Jesus. He used uh, Moses, was broken. Solomon, David's son, was broken. He had 700 wives. That's dysfunctional, okay? Uh, He used Paul. Paul called himself the chief of sinners, He wasn't just trying to butter himself up. He truly believed it. He was the worst of the worst. If you read about Peter in the New Testament, Peter was constantly saying the wrong things. He cut a guy's ear off to protect Jesus. He was a broken man. Judas was a broken man. Thomas lived with Jesus for three years, heard everything all the others heard. Jesus raised from the dead, and he still didn't believe it. He still said, I need to feel it for myself. He was a broken person. Jacob was, so God, the heartbeat of the gospel is that God is fully aware of your brokenness and wants to use you anyway. It is an incredible reality that we get to live. It's the people who have been vulnerable enough to struggle with God instead of other people. He didn't save them from their struggles. He might not save you from your struggle, but he'll save you from yourself. He'll save you from the the idea of what you think is the most important thing. So you have to ask yourself, have I allowed the Holy Spirit to do the necessary work to break off my own shell of self-righteousness? Have I allowed God, have I embraced my struggle with God enough that I allow him to break me in the best ways? Have I embraced it enough to struggle with God so that he can actually give me the wisdom to be able to struggle with other people? You see, because the reality is you probably find yourself in situations where boundaries do need to be created. You probably find yourself in situations where you do need to make decisions to like fix your life. But why would we go through the motions of trying to deal with worldly things and earthly things before we have fixed our eyes on Jesus? the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that will give wisdom. He's the one that will give guidance. He's the one that will open up the right doors at the right times. He is the one that will help you navigate disappointment, grief, bad news. Like he is the one that can bring peace that passes all understanding. So you have to maybe wonder, maybe you don't care about Jacob and Esau, but I always like to wonder, like what did happen when Jacob inevitably ran into Esau again? What did happen? Well, here's what happened. Jacob, he looks looks up, and there was Esau coming with 400 men. Esau got 400 men. Jacob's like, I'm dead, but this was fun. We, we, We had a good fight with God, and like, I'm ready. And so he does the whole thing. He sends everybody, and then this is what happened. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother in a like last ditch effort. But Esau ran to meet Jacob, embraced him, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. The extravagant gifts didn't matter. The, the pomp and circumstance, it didn't matter. In a moment, 20 years of grief, 20 years of pain, it was wiped away with mercy and grace. And now what it reminds me is that a few thousand years later, Jesus, he's telling an interesting story because Jesus, and we're going to get out of here in a minute, I'm sorry, but... Um, Jesus is always eating with tax collectors and sinners. 
Now, these are the people who were deemed the worst in society. Like, he, he, the, the religious leaders could not figure out why this religious man was willing to eat with such broken people. Why was he showing grace and mercy? And so Jesus, to answer them, he tells three stories. He tells the story of a lost coin, a lost sheep, and then he tells this wild story about a lost son. And it looks eerily similar to the story of Jacob and Esau in a couple ways. Because what ends up happening is this younger son, Jesus doesn't give him a name. He says the younger son went to his dad one day and says, Hey, dad, the inheritance you were going to give me when you died, I want it now. Essentially saying, you're dead to me. Give me the money. I want to go. And the way Jesus tells the story is the father obliges. He gives the son the money, knowing full well this isn't going to help you. This isn't going to make you feel better. This isn't going to better your situation. It might feel good in the moment, but ultimately you're going to be, you're going to be wounded. The son goes off and Jesus tells the story. He, he spent it on extravagant living. He went and lived the life. He partied. He did the thing until he got to the end of himself. He looks around and the story Jesus tells, the man, the, the young son is sitting in a pig pen eating pig's food, thinking about how good it was back at dad's house. He says to himself, at least at dad's house, I had enough to eat. At least at dad's house. And so he's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back and I'm going to apologize. I'm going to say I'm no longer worthy. Like writes this apology speech. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he like gets himself all ready and he's like, I'm going to do this thing. Now, the way the story goes is Jesus, he, he's telling it as if the father every single day is going outside and realizing something's off at the house because his younger son is not there. Because when the son starts walking back to give his apology speech, saying, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I messed up, I screwed up, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, it says that the father saw him afar off, similarly to how Esau saw Jacob afar off. And the way Jesus tells the story, he says, the father starts running towards Jacob or towards this younger son. And you could think, that the younger son's like, this is it. He is going to blast me into next Tuesday. Like the dude is running. But the Bible says the way Jesus tells the story is that the father ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And then they had a party. What Jesus is saying is that the same God who had mercy and grace on Jacob, the same God who threw his arms around him, the same God who displayed mercy and grace is the same God working right now. What Jesus is saying is, I want you to know that in the midst of your struggle, you will think that you need to approach God with some big apology letter. I want you to know that the arms of grace are wide enough to take on your story. The arms of mercy are wide enough to take the brokenness that's in your soul and make it whole. There is something so magnificent about what God does to the human spirit. And even though you might walk with a limp, that same God who was in Scripture is the same God working today right now. It's the same God who said, hey, all who are weary and heavy laden, come and you will find rest. He doesn't say all who are weary and heavy laden, get your life right and then come find rest. He says, no, in your anger, in your grief, in your discomfort, in your pain, in your lack of joy, in your disappointment, in your constant need to fix yourself, no, come to me with that and you will find rest for your very soul. Church, I promise you, after that, he invited the son and they had a party together. I can promise you that a church that is healthy is a church that struggles with God together. You cannot do this life on your own. You cannot beat disappointment on your own. You cannot beat grief on your own. You can't just find yourself on your own. The church is so important because it is a lightning rod of the grace of God. The church is a lightning rod of the mercy of God. Why? Because it's a room and a community full of broken people working out their salvation with fear and trembling, holding their boxing gloves and being like, I really just want to fight, but I'm going to allow the mercy and grace of God to take the gloves off and I know I can make it one more day. So church, we are healthy and we are better when we work within a diverse community that understands how to struggle with God together that understands that my life is better because of the broken people around me trying to find grace and mercy. My world is better because I can live my life with arms wide open, inviting a broken world in because we need to do it together. So Jesus, we thank you that you have called each and every one of us. God, we thank you that your grace 
is big enough. Your mercy are new. Your mercies are new every morning. God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is here, that your Holy Spirit is an active participant in our lives. So God, I pray that where we need wholeness, that you would bring it. When we need healing, that you would bring it. God, help us not to ignore the limps that we already have, but God, help them be uh, standard bearers of your goodness in our lives. And God, as we leave here today, God, I pray that you would give us a fresh wave of encouragement to be able to struggle with you, to remind us that you are with us even in our pain. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.